the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and, Th and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, and two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come as the wind and cleanse. Come as the fire and burn. Convert and consecrate our lives to our great good and your great glory through Christ our Lord. Please be seated. The call to Christian ministry is the call to fellowship with Jesus and his people as a prerequisite require element of God's plan to call others to himself. I'm going to read this quote by Albert Phillips Haddad. The call to Christian ministry is the call to fellowship with Jesus and his people. I paraphrase, as the necessary activity of God's plan to call others to himself. What struck me as so powerful, I wish I had written that, by the way. I, I'm only grateful I didn't claim it as my own. Um, is this whole notion that the call to ministry is a call to fellowship. 
fellowship with each other and with Jesus. And this is part of God's plan to call us all to God's self. When I was a little boy, and you've heard me say this before, I just have such fond memories of being out playing kickball and hearing my mother, just as the dusk was setting in, Michael, Kathleen, it's time to come in, which of course we ignored. Not really. The third time I think we finally came in. But that notion that God is, that God is calling all of us to God's self, every single one of us, and that God is longing for us to come near and be near God and be like God and act as God's hands and feet. I don't know what it is, but this notion of the Father calling us, saying, I want to be in relationship with you. And at the same time, and with equal vigor, saying, and I want you to help this one come to me. I want you to facilitate and amplify the longings of my heart for all people to come to me, really all creation to come to me, be reconciled with me, make peace with me. How different from the God we so often hear, which is, can't you do any better? I mean, can't you do any better? <gasps> How many of us hear that as God's call to us? Sort of this exasperated, when are they ever going to get it right? So what we hear is that God's activity of salvation is about God calling us to call others into fellowship with God and making peace with each other and making peace with God. And today's reading, for those who can receive it in its fullness, is really the recovery of the Christian practice of hospitality. And hospitality is not, first and foremost, a flow of goods and services, of lodging, food and comfort and cordiality from one who has, from one who has to one who doesn't have for a price. I find myself, sometimes that price is gratitude. I really want people to be hugely grateful when the church does something kind through my hands for someone. I really want that. I have to remember, oh yeah, that is not Christian hospitality. Simply giving without any expectation of receiving is Christian hospitality. We are called to recover this ancient tradition. And this is a quote from Professor Daryl Guder, who taught at Princeton. And I think we have a couple of Princeton grads. I don't know if they encountered Daryl Guder. He says this, recovering this ancient tradition of hospitality is essential in a world that has grown defensive and harsh. Through the practice of Christian hospitality, the church participates in God's peaceable kingdom. And here's what he says about the character of that hospitality. He says, such hospitality indicates the crossing of boundaries, ethnic origin, economic, political orientation, gender status, social experience, educational background. It is an openness to being welcoming to the other. And lastly, Guder says, without such communities of hospitality, the world will have no way of knowing that all God's creation is meant to live in peace, and I would add, in the heart of God. That, in fact, hospitality is not as we hear today in the readings. Hospitality is, is not 
a one-way street. It's not, I have stuff, you don't. I'm going to be hospitable and give it to you. In fact, hospitality has the same root as the word hostile. Not, I mean, yes, as a hostile, a youth hostile, but also as hostile, as, as stranger. Hospitals are places that welcome the strangers for the stranger's good of healing. We are called to be hospitable, not only to ourselves, but to, to, to strangers and really strange ones. Well, you know that. Look in the mirror. I mean, we're all a bit strange and odd. And this is what is happening in the first story that we hear about Abraham. You hear again, Abraham says, oh, I don't have it here. Abraham says, here's what they say. The Lord visited Abraham by the oaks of Marma in the heat of the day as he sat at the entrance to his tent. Cue for us. In the heat of the day, one does not typically sit at the entrance of the tent. One is inside the tent trying to avoid it. What is Abraham doing? Abraham is attending and anticipating a good thing that is going to happen to Abraham. Anticipating. We are called to be a people who anticipate that by welcoming the stranger, good things are coming our way. Abraham is awake. He is anticipating. And it says, the Lord came to Abraham. Well, this is a reflection over time because it was three people that came to Abraham and they just appeared. And if you look at the cover of your worship booklet, you'll see this, this, this beautiful, and I'm sure you recognize it, this um, this icon from Rublev, who lived in the 15th century. And it's the Trinity. But he called it under the oaks of Marma. It is a prefiguring that God comes to Abraham, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and attends them. And what does Abraham do? He welcomes them in and says, won't you stay won't you stay? This is a place of vulnerability. Abraham doesn't have an army with him. And here are these three majestic characters. I'm sure you'd be like, you know, you hear about how afraid people are when the face of God shows up. He must have been intimidating. But he doesn't run inside of his tent and hide. He says, can I get you something to eat? Will you dine with me? And they do. And in the midst of receiving the gift of hospitality, of food and water. The whole world receives the gift of the news of a nation out of which Jesus Christ will rise. A new nation will be yours. And this should give all of us hope because our youth group starts at age 50 and ends at about age 70. Yes, thank you for laughing as Sarah laughed. <laughs> Sarah's going to be pregnant. First thing Sarah says is, I'm going to be pleasured. Isn't that something? A blessing on the sensual. My. You're going to have a child, and what does Sarah do? Laughs. And God doesn't cut her down and say, whoop, you, not for you. She laughs. We are all being called by God to receive, to allow ourselves to be impregnated with the grace of God for the benefit of the whole world. How many of us hearing that word would have terminated that pregnancy? I'm too old. I can't do this. I'm not smart enough. I'm not qualified. Those are the sounds we make when we terminate the pregnancy that is within each of us to bring about the glory and majesty of God. 
I'm not good enough. God doesn't ask Sarah if she's good enough. He says, this is how it's going to be. And she laughs. And then she laughs with joy when the fulfillment of that pregnancy is manifest in Isaac. Think also about what hospitality means in terms of mission. Jesus sends the apostles out. He doesn't say, I've made a reservation for you at the Holiday Inn. Here are your meal cards. Make sure you pack everything you need. Jesus sends them out in vulnerability, having to rely on the goodness of their hosts. This should be a great alert for us. Self-reliance is not a Christian virtue. I really want you to take that in, but we're going to... Self-reliance is not a Christian virtue. Interdependence, making ourselves vulnerable, allowing others to give us, allowing us to receive instead of giving all the time, trusting that if we allow ourselves, if we put ourselves in a vulnerable place, that human beings, by God's grace, will actually respond appropriately. Think about God's invasion plan. God invades the world in Jesus. And how does he do it? He doesn't assemble an army. He sends a baby. He sends a baby and says, I trust you're going to take care of me. I'm coming to you in great vulnerability, and I trust that you will be hospitable to me. And in being hospitable to God in receiving Jesus, the whole world changed because Mary was receptive and said yes. And Joseph, through all of his shame and fear of being shamed and humiliated because his wife got knocked up, he stands up and stands with Mary and says, I too will receive the gift of this child. I too will safeguard God as God comes to us in great vulnerability. And this is all of what hospitality is. It is about the anticipation of receiving something more than we're going to get by doing it. At, at the community dinner last week, I sat down. I don't typically sit down because it's an uncontrolled environment, and I like control. So you never know what's good. You know, someone's going to say something. Someone's going to be inappropriate. It's just going to be uncomfortable. I sit down, and I find out two of the people I'm sitting with are former naval officers. One was a lieutenant JG. The other was a colonel. Excuse me, they were Army. The colonel was in charge of a whole section of Guantanamo Bay. They lived on the base in Guantanamo Bay back in the 60s and 70s. He was the colonel for that whole area, and they told stories about that. And then another guy by the name of Peter. We're sitting down talking to Peter, and they say, listen to Peter's story. And what is Peter's story? Peter was a kid in Burma when the Japanese... Uh, invaded that island. He was three years old. He had a brother that was five years older than him. His father and his mother and his brother and he all survived the war. A year after the war ended, his 10-year-old brother dies in a jeep accident. And I listen to this story that's told without self-pity, simply told as it is, and I realize, oh my God, I have just received, I have just received the story of all humanity. I stand in awe, I sat in awe at what these, this man must have gone through. And I think, and I am here, as the host. People of God, I invite us. I invite us to put ourselves in uncomfortable positions, vulnerable to receive the goodness that flows through the people of God. 
And in that vulnerability, allow kinship to develop so that you and I may continue to invite people to hear and respond to the call of God the Father, the call of God the Father to come into his heart and to make peace with God and to be at peace with each other. Let freedom ring. Amen.